Unsolved Mysteries. It is one of nature's most powerful and awe-inspiring forces. No one knows where or when it will strike. But if it does, the Olsen clan of Illinois is sure to take notice. For nearly a century, family members have had close encounters with one lightning bolt after another. When a young film student from California is killed in Mexico, the investigation becomes shrouded in sorrow and foreign intrigue. What was Patrick Kelly doing in Tijuana? Who is pursuing him? And who was driving his car in the days after he died? Is our destiny written in the stars? Can astrology predict whether we will be good or evil? In a fascinating special report, the leading astrologer reveals that serial murderers like Jeffrey Dahmer, the night stalker and son of Sam, might have been born to kill. And from the current case file, a special report on modern day vampires. To some it is just innocent diversion, to others it's a dangerous descent into an altered reality that in one case may have led to murder. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve one of tonight's unsolved mysteries. a force of nature so mysterious, so powerful, it's been called the finger of God. Where or who it may strike cannot be predicted. For one family in Illinois, every thunderstorm holds a potential for disaster, even death. I think the lightning likes us, but uh, once in a while, if we get a bolt that strikes, you know, real, real close, and start thinking about it. Since I've told, you know, coworkers and friends this, they tend to they tend to kid me a lot and uh, you know, nobody wants to give me a ride home when it's raining out. <laughs> um, they call me lightning boy and things like that. I think it'll strike me again and that someday it's going to get me and kill me. 1941 I stayed with her up Meet the Olsen family. Their ancestors, John and Jensina Olsen, came to America from Denmark in 1893. From them, subsequent generations have inherited a deadly legacy, a bizarre kinship with lightning. Was there, was there anybody else early on? Over the last four generations, at least 10 members of the Olsen family have had close encounters with lightning, terrifyingly close. Two of them have died. The first person that was um, killed by lightning was Chris Olson, and he died in 1899. It was a stormy day in May. Doctor, Chris is here. Come in, Chris, come in. Chris Olson, the third child of John and Jensina, was 23 years old. That afternoon, he went to visit his future bride and her father. I hear you having trouble on the farm. Yeah, yeah, the north fence shifted. Mm -hmm. ah. Hi. Hello. <gasps> Christ! Daughter, what's wrong? Chris Olson died instantly. The lightning never touched the others. Chris's family mourned him, unaware that his death was only the beginning. 22 years later, Chris's older brother, Oli, braved a late summer storm to feed his livestock. At the barn door, lightning struck him dead. It was then the Olson family began to wonder if death by lightning was a destiny they all might share. 
Christine Olson, Chris Tanoli's sister, lived her life with that conviction. By the spring of 1941, she was an old woman. But as her grandson Bill vividly recalls, she was still terrified of lightning. I came out for the summer, my summer visit, and uh, had a day that was very cloudy outside, and it uh, was dark early. And so she put me to bed, and I was laying there probably a half hour, and then could hear thunder in the background, and the lightning start, bolts of it coming down. We've got to go outside. But why? Well, because we've got to get away from the lightning. We'll go out to the old car. Well, the more I got out the bedroom door and his bolt of lightning hit, blew a hole in the wall, went across the metal ceiling. And the ceiling lit up like a neon sign. I think after that, we didn't stop too long. We just tore out the back door and ran out to the car. Bill and his grandmother passed the rest of the night huddled safely in the car. But the specter of lightning would continue to haunt the descendants of John and Jensina Olson. 20 years later, when Bill Thompson was grown and had a family, he had his second brush with death. Ball lightning shot in through the window, hit the toaster, blew the toaster off the table, went over, missed the little girl in the high chair, just went by her, this ball, hit the phone on the wall, and knocked the phone off the wall and went out through the phone area. So, but there, nobody got hurt, but the uh, toaster was gone and the telephone was gone, and everybody's very frightened. During a summer storm five years later, lightning again reached out to the Olsons. This time, it was Bill's first cousin, Connie. That day, her sister, Karen, had come to pick her up after work. Connie's encounter would be with a kind of lightning that seemed to emanate from the ground. It looked like it was going to be a thunderstorm. And there was a different kind of feeling about the atmosphere. It felt like it was full of um, electrical charges, and it was like an eerie kind of feeling. Every single joint in my body violently jerked, and then I fell to the ground. Connie! I don't remember anything after that because I was knocked unconscious. Connie's boss came to her aid and helped her to Karen's car. What happened? To everyone's complete astonishment, Connie was essentially unharmed. When I came to in the car, my body had a tingling sensation. Um, my arms and my chest area were numb. When my sister told me that um, I was struck by lightning, I was just really surprised. I had absolutely no idea that that's what happened. But then I thought, well, that's what lightning feels like. The lightning has always kind of been a little, a little strange to me. You know, this is something that. Uh, that uh, has always kind of scared me, and I'm sure some of it is due to that when, when I, the occurrence that happened when I was young. Bradley Hampel is fourth generation Olson. The year he turned 15, he visited his grandmother's farm in Burlington, Illinois. At the time, Bradley knew nothing about the Olson history. The light was so bright that I. You know, I couldn't see for a second. Finally, when I kind of shook off and I realized what had happened, you know, the lightning hit somewhere. And uh, there was a probably a 10-inch diameter charred circle on the door that was smoking. Since that time, I have been very scared of lightning. It, it, it wasn't necessarily a life-changing experience. I didn't turn good or anything because of it. But it, it was something that, uh, you know, it's a real, it's probably, it was probably the first time in my life that the realization is, wow, you could have just, just been killed. If you 
you have being struck by lightning next to your name? No, I don't. Okay. We probably should add that. Yeah, we should put a little lightning here. bolt on. <laughs> what is the link between this family and lightning? Could it possibly be something unique in their genetic makeup? I've never heard of another family where two family members had been killed by lightning. Whether the whole Olson family has a genetic predisposition to be struck by lightning, uh, I, I think is a question that I would answer no, because from a, from a scientific point of view, the lightning starts in the cloud, has no idea what's going on in the ground, uh, just works its way down randomly and then hits what's under uh, wherever it gets to. I believe that um, there's an organic reason why lightning strikes my family. Connie! And I also feel that what you fear most is what you attract. And many members of my family fear lightning, and therefore, they attract lightning to them. Everybody squeeze together so we can get a good family picture here. Given the family history, two fatalities and countless near misses, such fears are understandable. At family gatherings, the Olsons can't help but wonder who's next. One more. Let's say lightning this time for the occasion. Lightning! lightning. Next, when a young college student is killed in Mexico, his grieving mother and a determined private investigator embark on a desperate search for answers. And later, a revealing look at the bizarre world of modern-day vampires and the games they play. This is the Avenida Internacional, a cold concrete stretch of highway that runs along the border that separates Tijuana, Mexico from the United States. Every year, dozens of people are killed here as they dash through heavy traffic attempting to enter the U.S. illegally. On May 5, 1996, local rescue crews responded to the kind of accident scene that has become tragically commonplace. A pedestrian had been struck and critically injured. He carried no ID and was classified as desconocido or unknown. After this photograph ran in a local newspaper, the man was incorrectly identified as Luis Rodriguez. He died six days after the accident without regaining consciousness. Another 15 days would pass before it became known that the dead man was in reality Patrick Kelly, a film student at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. During those 15 days, Patrick's mother, Terry, had launched a desperate search to find him. In the process, she had uncovered a series of disturbing clues which had convinced her that there was much more to Patrick's death than just a traffic accident. Terry Kelly of Alberta, Canada is a management consultant who adopted Patrick when he was 18 months old. Patrick had been born into the Blood Indian tribe and immediately placed in foster care. As a young child, he learned to love writing and storytelling. As a teenager, he began to dream about making movies. In 1993, Patrick took a major step towards that goal. He was accepted into the prestigious film school at the University of Southern California. He loved the education he was getting. He uh, was very enthusiastic about his classes and about what they were learning. And, and from the very first day of school, they had to start writing. And, and that just, it's, it's like the school was geared towards who he was. How many times have you seen this film? But eight or nine times. Eight or nine times, and you're still not sick of it. It's great Friday night, May 3rd, 1996, found Patrick celebrating the end of the semester with a close friend, Michael Park. After months of painstaking effort, Patrick had just turned in his year-end project, a full-length motion picture script. I'm not a taxi driver. He was really upbeat. He was just really anxious to get on with his senior year and then, you know, hopefully get out in Hollywood. We watched the, the video for about 45 minutes, about 3.45. Um, I remember the time because uh, I had to get up pretty early the next morning, so I said, you know, I better leave and hit the sack. So it was about 3.45. Oh, 
I gotta get going. Didn't really mention anything at all about the weekend. Just really tired. He said he was gonna rest. I remember saying he was gonna rest. You know, I said, I'll see you tomorrow. And that was the last I saw him. One of the things we agreed on when he first went away to school was that we would always call each other on Sunday evening. In three years, he'd never missed the call. Uh, he didn't call that Sunday night, and I called him and tried all evening to get hold of him. Uh, so I knew right away that we had a problem. The following Tuesday, Terry asked Michael Park to go to Patrick's room. To Michael, it looked as if Patrick had just stepped out for a moment. Though Patrick's passport was missing, his wallet was on the desk, his bags and clothes in the closet, only the answering machine offered a clue. Hello, Patrick. This is Julia with Founders National Bank. Please give us a call. Thank you. Terry Kelly immediately phoned the bank. There had been several ATM transactions over that weekend in Mexico, and that it overdrew his account. Uh, so that was the first clue we had as to what direction he had been headed. That direction was due south. At 1024 Saturday morning, Patrick made a $60 withdrawal at a 7-Eleven in San Clemente, California, 63 miles from Los Angeles. At 6.08 p.m., another $135 was withdrawn at a bank ATM in the Tijuana tourist area. The next day, three more withdrawals at a bank ATM in downtown Tijuana led Patrick's account dry. Private detective Doug Roth was hired by Terry Kelly to track down Patrick. Roth began at the 7-Eleven in San Clemente. The surveillance tape from Saturday morning, May 4th, showed Patrick entering the store. Roth continued south. Before crossing into Mexico, he decided to check the parking lots along the border, where many tourists leave their cars before entering Tijuana. Roth hit pay dirt right away. It's a Honda Civic maroon. Uh, this car is been here for 16 days, sir. You have this car? Yes, sir. You have this car here? Mm-hmm. It's in the back. Patrick's car was parked along the back fence. It was caked with mud. It was damaged to the front right bumper, and the rear license plate was loose. Other clues suggested that someone other than Patrick had last driven the car. The driver's seat was much closer to the uh, steering wheel than would be consistent with someone who was six foot one inches tall. Uh, the radio was turned to a uh, Spanish-American radio station, which was, as we understand it, inconsistent with Patrick's listening habits. But we also had found a partially smoked cigarette in the ashtray of the car. Patrick was not a smoker and, uh, as we understand it, did not allow smoking in his car. You asked about pictures you could show around okay. Tijuana? Here's Doug Roth photo. provided photos of Patrick to the parking attendant. The lot manager then passed them along to his girlfriend who lived in Tijuana. She had called the Red uh, Cross in Mexico. She had called the local jails, and there was no result. Uh, finally, she went down to the morgue house with the pictures, and then she thought, now there's somebody there who looks just like the picture, and it was a good possibility it might have been him. After Doug Roth made a tentative identification, Patrick's mother, Terry, immediately traveled to the morgue in Tijuana to view the body, which was scheduled to be buried in an unmarked grave. It was, it was a very tough thing. They don't, they don't let you in the same room with them. You have to view them through glass. And, a, you know, a considerable a distance for, for those circumstances. But, uh, I, I, you know, I knew it was him. My initial reaction upon viewing the body was that he had been beaten severely. Uh, this is based principally on my observation of wounds about the face and upper body, chest area. But the Mexican authorities had attributed those injuries to the traffic accident. This is a current official account of how Patrick died. At approximately 1 a.m. on May 5th, a motorcyclist was heading east along the Avenida Internacional when two pedestrians suddenly darted out in front of him. <laughs> it 
It is still unclear exactly how Patrick was misidentified as Luis Rodriguez, but the confusion apparently began as soon as paramedics arrived on the scene. The rescue workers described the pedestrian as being five foot five, 27 years old, obese, wearing, I believe it was a blue t-shirt and uh, white tennis shoes. My son was 200 pounds, six foot one, wearing a tan t-shirt at least earlier that day and black van uh, topsider shoes. The clothes Patrick was wearing were destroyed at the hospital. The Mexican authorities believe the garbled description was an honest mistake. When you're working on a person that's dying on you, the people work fast and they do a report, maybe they did it too fast and they didn't uh, see the exact height. He was lying down, so it could have been difficult, but that, that question could be answered by the paramedics that, that looked at the scene. The confusion extends beyond the question of Patrick's identity. Mexican authorities concluded that all of his injuries resulted from the accident. However, an autopsy commissioned by Terry Kelly and performed in the United States concluded, quote, findings do not support an interpretation that death was due to a motor vehicle accident. Despite the irregularities, the reports all now agree that Patrick Kelly lay critically injured in the hospital room at 2 a.m. on May 5th. But some 13 hours later, at around 5 p.m., Patrick's ATM card was used to make three withdrawals. The evidence clearly indicates that uh, transactions had occurred after he was comatose in Mexico with his ATM card that that ATM card had been used with a PIN number which he would not have reasonably given up or had any need to have written down anywhere. Maybe he came down with somebody of his confidence that he can confine in this person his PIN numbers or his documents or whatever. Maybe his friend took money because they didn't know the city or because they uh, needed money to move or get back to the States and report that he was missing. We really don't know. One more perplexing mystery involves Patrick's car. According to the parking lot records, somebody paid the $60 fee and drove the car off the lot on May 15th, four days after Patrick died. The next day, the car was returned to the exact same parking space. Doug Roth believes it all adds up to one inescapable conclusion. Patrick Kelly was running for his life when he was hit by the motorcycle. I believe Patrick went to Mexico with, with another individual. And I believe that by 5 o'clock in the afternoon, they had met with some unsavory characters and had probably been taken against their will hostage, had been beaten, uh, that their PIN number had been gained. And likely while they were held nearby that place where the accident occurred, they made a break for it. And during the course of that, may have recklessly ran across the street into the oncoming traffic. One of them was struck, one of them was not. One of them made it away. Finding the answers has proven almost impossible. Because Patrick died in Tijuana, the United States and Canada have no jurisdiction to investigate, leaving Terry Kelly to sort out the contradictions and discrepancies on her own, all the while knowing that her only son is gone forever. But the hardest part of, of all of this, of course, has been going home without him. The most frustrating and unforgivable part is that nobody will help. No official agency assigned such, such jurisdiction will help us find out what happened and will help us uh, get justice for what happened. Coming up, participants defend vampire games as innocent fun. Others fear the line between fantasy and reality is easily blurred. When we return, Dahmer, Berkowitz, Ramirez, notorious killers all. Noted astrologer Carolyn Reynolds believes their thirst for murder was preordained at birth by a unique configuration of the planets and the stars.
Jeffrey Dahmer. He lured at least 11 young men to his apartment in Milwaukee. He drugged, strangled, and dismembered each of them in a real-life chamber of horrors. Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. He invaded homes in the Los Angeles area. He murdered at least 16 people, most of them women. David Berkowitz, son of Sam. He turned New York City into his personal hunting ground, randomly shooting 13 people, leaving six of them dead. What forces compelled these notorious killers? Genetics, the environment, or are these men linked by influences far more mysterious? Astrologers might say that they were born to kill, their destiny written in the stars. Astrology is like a road map where the planets were positioned at the exact moment you were born. Astrology is the science of celestial bodies in relationship to an infant, and then it progresses through their life. For most of us, astrology is little more than a playful diversion, to be enjoyed but not taken seriously. But perhaps there is something more to this so-called science. Those who studied astrology are convinced that you can foretell the course of a person's life by reading his or her astrological chart. But can a chart also predict whether someone will be good or evil? We asked Carolyn Reynolds and two other astrologers to study the charts of roughly 20 subjects. Incredibly, the charts that made the most startling impression were those of four notorious serial killers, Richard Ramirez, David Berkowitz, Edmund Kemper, and Jeffrey Dahmer. To understand astrology, you must understand an astrological chart. The chart divides the sky into 12 houses, each representing a facet of life. For example, parents and home is the fourth house, death is the eighth. Each house contains a portion of the 360 degrees that make up a circle. According to astrologists, where the stars and planets fall in these houses has specific meaning. When Carolyn Reynolds sat down to study the astrological charts, she was given virtually no identifying information beyond date, time, and place of birth. Amazingly, of the 19 charts analyzed, Carolyn zeroed in on Dahmer, Ramirez, Berkowitz, and Kemper as probable serial killers. If you look at charts, there's a certain beauty and harmony where they flow and theirs were jumbled and knotted, and, um, and all their planets were just bumping up against each other, causing friction and trouble. In each case, without knowing which chart belonged to which subject, Carolyn was able to talk about specific details relating to the killer's crimes, details that proved to be remarkably accurate. For instance, in 1988, Richard Ramirez pled guilty to murder and reportedly bragged to a fellow inmate, quote, I've killed 20 people. I love all that blood. This was the most obvious killer. He has in the third house, the sun and the moon in the sign of Pisces. He had five out of seven of the worst degrees that you could have. And one of them was the degree of the devil. Who's safe? During his trial, Richard Ramirez openly professed to worshiping Satan and proudly displayed a pentagram, a sign of the devil, on the palm of his left hand. Then there's David Berkowitz, son of Sam. When he was arrested, he claimed that he was instructed to kill by a neighbor's dog and had no control over his own actions. Without knowing that she was reading Berkowitz's chart, Carolyn Reynolds came to the same conclusion. I don't think he had much of a choice in this. He was born with the planets that gave you a potential in the lineup for multiple personality or a split personality. And it's in the house of death. When Carolyn Reynolds read the chart that turned out to be Jeffrey Dahmer's, she found the subject to be, quote, destructive, heartless, and cruel. Carolyn concluded that if he wasn't so evil, he would be a murder victim himself. And that's exactly what Jeffrey Dahmer became. In 1994, he was beaten to death in prison. 
I was also involved in killing co-eds because my mother was... This interview with mass murder Edmund Kemper was conducted in 1984. Kemper's chart was perhaps the most revealing of all, notably in the fourth house, which represents parents and home. Again, Carolyn did not know whose chart she was analyzing. There's a lot of activity at home, and it's all unusual and not good. Automatically, I'm thinking something's not right here about what he's doing at home. And there were some other problems with him. The position of the moon is pretty much working against that house. In astrology, the moon is a symbol for mother. In the early 1970s, Edmund Kemper murdered eight women, six co-eds, his mother's best friend, and his mother. Criminal psychologist Candace Scrappick is familiar with Kemper's case. It's clear that there was a, a very tumultuous relationship between Ed and his mother. From a young child, he had fantasized killing her. The six young women that he chose, consciously, he says, were women that represented women whom his mother had said he was not good enough for. Dr. Scrappick has interviewed a dozen serial killers. She believes that they are products of both their environment and biology, including their genetic makeup. That is like a Mars to a Saturn or a Mercury to a Saturn. While Dr. Scrappick does not adhere to astrology, she does find Carolyn Reynolds' observations intriguing. We brought the two of them together to compare notes. It's interesting. There are certain concepts that uh, certainly I'm relating to in, in this particular case. I'm most interested in trying to come to a better understanding of why it is serial murderers do what they do. Psychologically, of course, and as a psychologist, uh, that's probably my bias. I hope you can understand where, oh, where I'm do. coming from in the sense The truth is, I honestly don't know if there's any value to astrology. I don't dismiss it, I don't discount it as a valid factor in human behavior. I just really cannot say one way or the other. Are certain people destined to kill the moment they are born? Or is it possible to reverse what Carolyn Reynolds believes is written in the stars? The stars incline, they do not impel. I think love, for example, transcends everything. I think if a person had a real strong, nurturing, loving mother and father uh, relationships around them, that it might help them not to act in the negative fashion. It's a road map, and like any other road map, sometimes you take a different route. I think it's a lot like that. Astrology has been labeled a pseudoscience because it relies so heavily on personal interpretation. Skeptics among us may dismiss it altogether, but before you do, you should realize that many famous people have consulted the stars at critical moments in their lives. Among them, Presidents Ronald Reagan and George Bush, psychologist Carl Jung, and during World War II, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill reportedly consulted his astrologer before planning battle strategy. When we return, a 14-year-old girl lured away from her home. Five teenagers arrested for a brutal double murder. The common thread? Vampire fantasy games that authorities say can turn frighteningly real. They are dark. They are dangerous, they are sexy. From Transylvania to Hollywood, vampires have been popular characters in movies, literature, and legend for generations. Today, fans of the undead are giving ancient myths fresh life all across the country. Wannabes play out fantasies in bizarre vampire nightclubs. On the internet, vampire chat rooms attract thousands of hits every day. And players of various games such as Vampire the Masquerade gather regularly to act out their dark dramas. Get a slight case of dying. Um, a slight you are watching a, a game in progress. In this scene, the man seated is a willing victim. I think the game really affords people uh, an opportunity to 
uh, confront the dark side of human nature, which is so much a part of all of us, and face it rather honestly and, and do it in an entertaining uh, way, do it in a safe environment. For the vast majority of players, the many different vampire games are harmless fun. But for some participants, the craze may have a sinister side. Sometimes a game can go wrong. Fantasy can bleed into a brutal reality. Tonight, we'll look at three such cases. Are they isolated events, or are they part of a disturbing new trend? This 14-year-old girl disappeared one week before Christmas in 1996. Police suspect that Kira O'Connell of Rochester, New York, may have been lured from her home by a man she met via the internet on a website for vampires. I believe she's being held against her will. I believe he's not letting her call. I don't know if she's even aware what's going on. Authorities believe Kara O'Connell is with this man, 22-year-old Brooker Malte, a senior airman in the US Air Force who has now been listed as a deserter. Malte and several friends allegedly ran their own vampire chat room on the internet, a Black Rose nightclub. Kira started playing the game and somehow met some people that were playing the game and started shooting off into a separate chat room, talking to this man one-on-one. -on -one. And we know now from reading his emails to her that he figured out how to talk to her, how to get inside her mind, how to basically control it. Generally speaking, we're looking at kids who are usually intelligent children and want to belong, want to be a part of something, want to participate. And so this comes along and reaches out to them and says, there are no rules. It's exciting. It's different. Uh, mom and dad won't like it very much. That's another element that sometimes is a draw. And once they get involved in it, sometimes it, you know, it becomes more than just a game to these children. Children like that are perfect targets for men like 27-year-old John Christopher Bush. Police in Virginia Beach, Virginia, say that Bush convinced local junior high and high school students that he was a powerful vampire. John Christopher Bush offered them a family, a family unit, a place to belong, things to do. He gave them tasks. He gave them responsibility, uh, all, of course, at a high price. That price was a loss of innocence. Bush used the hook of vampirism to seduce teenage girls. They didn't really know what they were consenting to until sometimes it was too late. And they got involved in this. And then, of course, the embarrassment factor takes over and the fear. And, and, and you know, Mr. Bush went to great lengths to cultivate that fear. Uh, he talked to them about uh, a blood hunt. Blood hunt is an activity in the vampire game, except he would explain it to them not as a game, but as, I will take you out into the woods, you'll be cut loose, and we will hunt you. We will hunt you down. John Christopher Bush was found guilty on 30 counts, including rape, unlawful carnal knowledge, and crimes against nature. He was sentenced to 26 years in prison. Two months after Bush's conviction, another so-called vampire family grabbed the headlines. Five teenagers from the small town of Murray, Kentucky, were arrested for a shocking double murder. One of them was Heather Wendorf. Her parents were the victims. The alleged vampire leader was 16-year-old Rod Farrell. Any the city police detective said that he would cut his arm and let others suck his blood as sort of some kind of ritualistic, uh, they call it being embraced, embraced into the family. The whole bloodletting thing was, was appealing to him, and bloodletting is, is nothing more than, than letting somebody else feed off of you. We never promoted it. And once I found out, I was quite shocked that he, he was involved in that. Farrell and his clan reportedly liked to play vampire at various places around town. One favorite hangout was an abandoned building they called the Vampire Hotel. Another was a local graveyard where these pictures of Rod Farrell were taken. Some claim Farrell didn't see vampirism as a game, but as a birthright. He told the sheriff's department he thought he was immortal. He told the sheriffs that he didn't think whatever happened to him wouldn't hurt him in the long run, more or less, in not so many words. Uh, he feels he's invincible. He honestly believes he's a vampire. 
Is vampire make-believe inherently evil and dangerous? Probably not. Does it create an atmosphere where aberrant behavior is promoted? There's no way to know. But for the family of Kira O'Connell, the philosophical debate about vampire games is of little consequence. They just want Kira to come home. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, this photograph of rap music star Tupac Shakur was taken on the Las Vegas Strip just minutes before Shakur was cut down in a hail of gunfire. Even though dozens of people watched the tragic drama unfold, authorities have yet to establish a motive or identify the killer. Can a perfectly normal person suddenly burst into flame without apparent cause? Mainstream science says no, but some researchers claim the evidence suggests otherwise. Don't miss our special report on a most bizarre phenomenon, spontaneous human combustion. Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.